welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Any friend of the F-18 is a friend of ours. We have, of course, the F-A-18 prototype, the YF-17, and this morning we have a really good friend of the F-18 because he is one of the pilots who flew her into combat and tested her mettle. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce Lieutenant Commander Roderick Kurtz, United States Navy, retired. Hot Rod, the podium is yours. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, it is wonderful to be here uh, at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Um, an honor to be here and a great crowd. I look forward to uh, speaking with you afterwards and, uh, and meeting some of you and your stories. Uh, I was asked to come here and, uh, and tell you a little bit about flying the F-18, what it was like flying it, what it's like in combat, and then some extraneous uh, flying I did uh, in a Mark 58 Hawker Hunter that ended in an ejection. All right, so background on myself, uh, Roderick Kurtz is my name. My Navy call sign is Hot Rod. I retired from the Navy about three years ago after 20 years of service, most of which was flying the F-18. I grew up uh, Orange County, so not far from here, Fountain Valley, went to high school there, attended UCLA to get an aerospace engineering degree because I knew that was something I wanted to think about and do. About my junior year, I thought, well, maybe I can put that off just a little bit uh, and do something that I can't put off. Uh, and so I joined the Navy uh, to be a pilot. That was my goal. Uh, I was fortunate in my timing and they let me do that. So off to Navy Officer Candidate School after UCLA. Went into flight school and commissioned in 1996. Some of the planes you fly through flight school, uh, the T-34, that's been retired recently, uh, replaced by the T-6 uh, Texan II. Uh, then on to Meridian, Mississippi to fly the T-2 Buckeye. I'm fairly certain that is retired, although there's a few in private hands still flying. That's the picture you see on the slide. T-45A Goshawk, that's what I carrier qualified in the very first time. And not until you've done that do you get your wings. So I was winged in February of 99. And at that point they said, uh, we need you to go to the fleet, we need you to fly a jet. And I said, I'm happy to do that. And so off to Lemoore, California, which is up by Fresno in the Central Valley. And I spent uh, about 15 of my 20 years in the Central California base of Lemoore flying F-18s. The squadrons I were in are on there, VFA-113, the Stingers, my first and proudest squadron, VFA-154, uh, a two-seat Super Hornet squadron, and then VFA-122, where I was an instructor for a couple of tours. Did four deployments, as you can see, 2,800 hours, 643 arrested landings, and 169 hours of combat time on 41 missions that I spent from the flight deck, the majority of which were from the Abraham Lincoln. Flying the F-18 is fantastic. Uh, and after a fair amount of time and hard work, you suddenly realize you're, you're the luckiest person in the world. Day flying around the aircraft carrier in an F-18 is just amazing. Uh, it, it's hard, extremely hard, it's fun, and it takes years of practice to get there. Uh, so when you finally get that opportunity and you finally start getting sufficient at doing it and, and it doesn't scare you anymore, it becomes just the sport of kings, we call it. Uh, the catapult shots from zero to 180 uh, in two and a half seconds, the, the arrested landings where you go from 150 to zero in, in 350 feet on the flight deck, if you're lucky and you stop. Uh, not a, I'd like to say all of mine stopped, not all of them. Um, it's fantastic. And then to be out there and realize that the choreography of the airplanes, the people on the flight deck, the ship itself is all done without talking by and large. It's all done either with hand signals or just observing what other people do, are doing and knowing and trusting that we're all on the same page, that we all know how this, this dance goes. Uh, and then realizing that you've got hundreds of people on the flight deck, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of pounds of metal at your, uh, you know, flying and moving around on the flight deck, thousands of dollars of stuff, all for you, and not to mention 4,000 sailors on that ship to keep it going and doing what it does. Also that you can go take off in this airplane and do what the president asks you to do. Uh, and so the days when you learn to do that and you get out there in a, in a gray machine like the one we have out here just outside the door is fantastic. You feel like the king of the world and you wouldn't rather be anywhere else or do anything else. Those are the good days. They're fantastic. They're not all good days. Some are great days. 
After about three years in my first tour with VFA 113, and there's a picture of me, uh, that would have been about 2002, and me just proud to be part of the F-18 world and be a part of a community and a squadron and a team that trains to do a job. 2003, the good days become great days. I'd been in the squadron for almost three years. We'd been on deployment for over six months. A normal deployment at that time was six months, so we should have been home. Uh, and we were asked to go back to the Gulf uh, for some more work. During that six months of deployment prior to this day, we had uh, participated in Operation Southern Watch and Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. So we had participated in what are considered combat missions, but they were fairly tame. We weren't getting shot at uh, on a regular basis. We weren't uh, asked to deploy ordnance. We were really there as a presence to just exert our authority where we told them we would. But come 2003, things have changed. We get sent back to the Gulf at about eight or nine months of deployment, and we know there's only one reason to go back, and it's not to be a presence. It's to do the job that we've been training to do from day one. Um, so I was fortunate to be senior in the squadron. Love the sound of airplanes. Uh, I was fortunate to be senior in the squadron, and my roommate, uh, his call sign was Guido and I, we'd been in the squadron for three years together, and we're getting ready to, to rotate out when we got asked to go back with the squadron uh, for combat operations. And there is nothing better than going into that environment with your roommate and your best friend, uh, not with the senior pilot in the squadron wondering how he's gonna take care of it, not having to take care of a junior pilot in the squadron, knowing that when I look out of my cockpit and see my wingman next to me, that I'm looking at myself. I know him like the back of my hand, he knows me, we're predictable. We take care of things without saying them sometimes. So I was very fortunate in that regard. But we were asked to do what needed to be done. Uh, and on night one, in March of 2003, the strike groups in the, uh, in the Persian Gulf were asked to go strike Baghdad. Our role in that mission uh, was a small role, but the entire air wing on the ship was putting together one large force strike. Squadrons from all the Hornets, or ships, or airplanes from all the Hornet squadrons were asked to come and be on that strike. And uh, Guido and I's role was to actually be in front of the very first strike package to go deliver essentially radar decoys to muddy up the picture for the surface air missiles that we knew would be coming. So the folks behind me, the 15 or 20 planes behind, behind me and my wingmen have the bombs. They've got the missiles, the bombs, the armament. We're going in first to make the picture tough for them. So our job is to make their life easy. Uh, but consequently, we're the first ones there. Launching from that ship that night uh, was obviously a pretty important moment in my life. You prepare for it, you've been preparing for it for three years, but this night is different. They've given you survival charts, uh, they've given you uh, a pistol that's loaded in case you get shot down in enemy territory. We've exchanged letters to, uh, to each other, hey, if I don't make it back, give this to my wife. You know, so you have those moments, and then you're prepared. You go get something to eat, because getting shot down while you're hungry is no place to be. Uh, and so you launch with the team of people that you've been training with for nine months behind you. And there's a picture from that night. Uh, it was an amazing night, and everybody just went about their business. Wasn't a lot of hoopla. There wasn't a lot of time for anything else. It was just a matter of doing what we'd been trained to do, uh, and knowing that tonight you don't make mistakes. You do your best you can because uh, it counts. So we did that. We went on. We dropped our radar decoys over Baghdad uh, before anybody really knew what was going on. But as our decoys came off and they went in towards Baghdad, they suddenly knew what was going on. Uh, the skies light up. We turn around and go home. And about five minutes later comes the strike package. Uh, and we, you know, a virtual high five to them as they pass the other way. Uh, and they go do their mission. So their mission went off without a, uh, without a hitch other than uh, one pilot who had to divert for a refueling problem into Saudi Arabia, but everybody came back. The mission was a success, and that started OIF, uh, what they later called shock and awe. Uh, and we, the aircraft carrier team, did what we needed to do. Uh, and that's a big moment. It's real easy to go home at Christmas, talk to your friends, talk to your family, whatever, and say you're a fighter pilot, or what are you doing now? I'm flying F-18s off the ship. And that's, that's great to tell that story. But until you get this opportunity, you don't really know. You don't really know what kind of a fighter pilot you are. Uh, and so this was a chance 
to really for all of us to kind of test ourselves. Like, were we paying attention or are we doing this just for looks? So uh, it was a great moment. Uh, the next three weeks, we went on to, to do everything they asked us to do from the Abraham Lincoln. And because we'd been there for over nine months now, they said, you guys get to go home first. So they told our ship and our crew and, our, uh, and all the folks on it that thanks for your work. The new carriers will take over from here and you guys get to go home. So that was a big deal. Uh, to a man, all the people that I knew and flew with did what they were supposed to do. They did what we expected them to do and we did what we practiced doing. And so it was a big moment for myself and for all the others out there that knowing that when, when it comes time to it, this hasn't all just been for show, that we're out there to do the job that we've been asked to do. And so that was a big moment for me. Uh, and that's why I consider that uh, one of the great days. About two weeks later, we're still operating out there uh, in Iraq from the uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the war has progressed quite a bit in two weeks. Uh, and we went from having pre-planned missions of knowing what significant target we were supposed to go after to, hey, you're going to launch and you're going to find out when you're airborne where the new target is. The ground forces were moving so fast, the battleground was changing so quickly that there wasn't time to tell you before you launched. You had to launch, go fly, refuel, go over Baghdad or someplace similar, and find out airborne what your target was. Uh, on, a, on a particular day, about two weeks later, we had launched. Uh, the weather was pretty bad, uh, which was unusual, uh, I would say, but uh, we'd had some clouds roll in, and we knew that we had to climb to almost 30,000 feet to get out of the clouds in the Gulf. When we get over land, it's not better. So we go fly on, and that's not a problem for us in the F-18. We're happy to fly along at 35,000 feet. Uh, and to tell you the truth, the GPS-guided bombs don't know any difference. So on that day, because the weather is, is bad, we know we won't be able to see a target. We know we won't be able to take a picture of it. We're going to use GPS-guided bombs that are just going to go to a point that, uh, that our intelligence and our target folks have told us to, to program them to. So we do that, and that goes off without a hitch, and we decide to go home. On our way home, we enter that weather again. And we're out over the Gulf, uh, what we call feet wet now, and we're looking for the tanker. And we're like, well, he's not going to be at 30,000 feet. He's supposed to be down at 15,000 feet or so. So we'll just start descending until we get there and call him on the radio. We're descending, and it's still cloudy. We're descending, and it's still cloudy. We're descending, and it's still cloudy. And nobody's answering on the radio. And our first mission uh, is to get out of the clouds. Uh, my wingman Guido is, is glued to my right wing and just follow me through the weather until we can break out and actually get to some place where we can look around. That happened at about 2,000 feet. So from 30,000 to 2,000 feet, we kept waiting for the weather to get better and to find a tanker to tell us what altitude was a good altitude to tank at. Well, we get down to 2,000 feet and we realize he's not here. Uh, so we call some other folks. They politely inform us that he moved 300 miles into Saudi Arabia and nobody bothered to tell us. So, that's our first start of things not going really as we expected. Like, all right, well, we're over the Gulf. The, the, the enemy threat is over. Our, our only threat now is really our own. Uh, our own people and the weather uh, and flying our own airplanes. So we've got a little bit of time. We can go back to the ship. We're not far from the ship. The problem is our recovery time is not for another hour, hour and 15 minutes, which means they have got the flight deck prepared to launch the next mission of aircraft. So we call them up and say, hey, our tanker fell out. Can we land now? And they said, no. If I have to pull all the airplanes off of the landing area so you, to, so you can land, they will miss their missions. So our mission was completed, but there's an entire flight deck full of people that are launching on their mission. They're going to support Marines. They're going to support ground troops. They need to do their job. It's not just an inconvenience. They have a job to do. So we recognize that. If they say they're not going to remove everybody off the flight deck just so we can land for gas, then I get that. So I asked them if we could have uh, a refueling tanker from the ship nearby. If there was somebody that had enough gas, that could get us the extra hour of flight time. They said, hold on, let us take a look. Yep, there's an S3 uh, tanker. That's their mission is to hang around the ship and uh, refuel people that need it. And I said, that's great. Where are they? And the radar, radar controller says, hold on a second. Uh, Blue Wolf 705, which is the tanker's call sign, where are you? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't need a controller to ask him where he is. I can ask him where he is just fine. But the fact that my controller doesn't know where he is has me worried now a little bit too. 
So if they don't know where the tanker is, how are they going to tell me how to get there uh, and if he's got gas? So I'm starting not to feel real good about this. The problem is our divert, which we never launch out of the ship uh, within range of land without knowing what the emergency divert would be. If we can't come back to the ship, we know there's a runway somewhere and we know how much gas it takes to get there. So we are looking at our gas, and we know how far away it is to go to Al Salam Air Force, Al Jabber Airfield in Kuwait. I'm like, all right. The problem is the weather. The weather wasn't predicted, and we our tanker wasn't around. We don't even know if that airfield is open. It's gotten bad and worse. And if it's bad over the water, it's probably pretty bad over land too. So we haven't talked to them. The weather forecast has not gone uh, as expected. So we know we can go there but we really don't know what to expect when we get there. I trust the ship. I've been on the ship for nine months now. I know how to get aboard the ship, and I trust the people there will get me on board in bad weather. I don't know about a, a foreign airport that I've never been to with a war going on in bad weather and now a sandstorm. So I don't want to go there if I don't have to, but we're chasing around an S3 trying to find gas. We can't find them. The radar controller isn't any help. Uh, they keep asking us where we are. Well, that's not, I don't, I've got enough problems without having to explain where I am to you. So uh, we start talking about it with my wing, and I say, hey, we're about, we're about five minutes from having to go to Kuwait. He says, okay, and as we do that, we find an S3. Uh, I find an, an airplane on my radar that looks like it ought to be an S3. It's at the right altitude, it's traveling about the right speed, uh, and it's only seven or eight miles away. So we start heading towards it, but it's heading away from me, and I can't talk to it. So we hit our five minutes, and I tell my wingman, who's a few hundred pounds lower on gas than me, I said, hey, you got to go. Uh, I've got maybe five minutes more gas than you. Let me go see if I can get gas. If I can get gas, I'll call you back, uh, and I'll let you know that at least we can get some gas from a tanker. So I peel him off, and I tell him to go ahead and go to, to Al Jabber and hope things are going to go well there. And he disappears into the clouds and departs. I'm chasing down, and it turns out it's an S3. It's a tanker. I'm, this is great. I pull up next to him, kind of unsurprised. I put out my refueling probe, the international symbol that I need gas, uh, and he shakes me off. That's not a good sign. So I make a call over the radio. We have a guard frequency, as you probably know, hoping he's listening to it. Uh, S3 with the Hornet next to you. I need gas now. And he shakes me off. I'm like, well, either he doesn't have gas, he doesn't want to give his gas, or he's got to save it for somebody else. I don't know which. And as I look out in front of us, about seven or eight miles, I see an aircraft carrier, but it's not mine. Uh, and now I know this is a bad place to be because I don't know when they're landing. I don't know when they're taking off. And this guy doesn't have gas for me, so it's time for me to go. So I've dragged this on a little longer than I should have, and it's time to go uh, on my own profile to get to Kuwait. Uh, the profile to save the most gas in a jet airplane is to go to full throttle and climb up as high as you can get and glide the last halfway there. That's, I mean, you don't shut it down, but you go back to idle uh, once you get up to 30,000 feet, depending on how far away it is. So you burn most of your gas to get there on the climb out through. Now I've got to go through this weather again. Climb on up, and then when I get there, pull it to idle and glide the last 20, 30 miles to Kuwait. In the meantime, try to find the, the airport, try to find the radio frequency, hope the weather is good enough to land uh, and so I know that's all on my plate. I get flying, I get turned around, I go there. Uh, I try calling the airfield and I don't get a response. And that's when I remember the frequency they had briefed us was not the same as the one the day before. And I thought, towers don't change their frequencies very often. So I think there was a mistake and nobody's answering. So I get back a hold of somebody in the ship. Can you get me a good frequency for for Al Jabber Airfield. I get somebody, I finally get a hold of them. I'm climbing through 30,000 feet, getting ready to come on in. Call them up. They say, first thing first, how's the weather? And they're like, ah, it's okay. It's landable. It's 1,000 feet. We got some sand and some rain coming in, but it's open. I said, great. I said, what about my wingman? Is he on his way in? Has he landed yet? And they're like, we haven't talked to anybody else. So that's, that's a bad sign. And I realized using the two radios that I have, I've, not, I've turned off the frequency that I have with my wingman, which was okay. He was going on his mission. I go back to the frequency we'd been using all flight, and I call him. I say, hey, Guido, are you, uh, are you almost there yet? I, he's like, man, I can't talk to the tower. The frequency, just nobody answers. I said, I know, uh, but here's a good frequency, and by the way, the weather's good. He's like, ah, oh, thank God. He says, by the way, I can no longer even change the frequency 
on my first radio. The one I've got with you is stuck on your frequency, but I can't talk to Tower anymore. I'm like, okay, I'll call him and let him know where you are. He says, trust me, you're going to break out. You're going to have some decent visibility, and you'll be able to land at the field. He's like, good, because I find out later. He was already finding places on essentially a chart that were, uh, you know, uninhabited. Casey had to put the airplane into the dirt somewhere and eject. At least it wasn't going to go into some houses or anything like that. So he goes in and lands. Five to eight minutes behind him, I land. We're both less than 10 minutes of fuel left, which is really maybe a chance to go around one more time in the pattern, maybe. Uh, and we land, and it's muddy, and it's sandy, and it's miserable. Uh, we roll out to the end of the runway, and there are Marines that have now taken charge of the field, and they're there to fill up people with gas. And so this picture that you see there is the picture my wingman took of me while we were waiting to get the gas from the Marines. And I had never been so happy in my life to see a Marine sitting in the mud uh, with, a, with a poncho on, unhappy, to go give me gas. Uh, and so that was a huge relief just to get on deck and be happy. As you can tell, if you look carefully, the, uh, the bunker behind us has a hole in its roof. That was from uh, the first Gulf War. Um, so that wasn't from two weeks prior. That was from the first Gulf War. And you can see the tail of what I think is an F-15 uh, poking up there. So the Allied forces had kind of taken it over. Uh, but I am now no longer in a place that I am familiar with. I'm, I'm in Kuwait. I'm supposed to be on a ship. Uh, I know I'm supposed to fly later that night with more missions to do. And here we are stuck in Kuwait. But we're happy for the moment. And we take a little breather. And we get our gas. And we think, all right. We know when the next recovery is for the ship. We'll take off with a full tank of gas. We'll go back to the ship and we'll just wait. Uh, and it'll, the day will move on. We'll be all right. At least right now, we're, we're OK. So we do that. We wait an hour or two, get gas, and we take off. Uh, our day was not over. As we get back to the ship, uh, the F-18, especially in a combat uh, loadout, doesn't carry a lot of extra gas when it lands on the ship. There is a maximum landing weight that you can land on the ship. And when you start carrying bullets in the nose and pylons and extra fuel tanks by themselves even, that landing weight stays the same, but the amount of fuel you can carry to make that weight starts getting smaller and smaller because you're carrying all this other stuff. So this is a common thing with the F-18. There's a reason why the Super Hornet carries much more gas and can land with more gas. But the F-18 Charlie, we're coming in to land. And we look down, and the weather's good. We see the ship. We're getting into our routine. Like I said, sport of kings. We're going to go have a day landing on the ship and come back and tell a good story. Uh, and we're waiting for our recovery. And the first guy comes in, and the F-18 Charlies, we start uh, dumping gas because we're too heavy from all the gas we took. We're dumping gas. We're dumping gas. And the first aircraft gets to the 90-degree position, maybe 45 seconds before landing. And the call comes from the tower, a 99 everybody. F-18 at the 90, go around. IFR recovery's in progress. And the ship had found the storm. So while we were sitting there, and there was a big wall of sand and storm, the ship just kept steering right towards it. Well, that's where the wind comes. But, and absolutely within the minute of the first plane trying to land, the sandstorm hits, and you can't see anything. So, and the, and the worst part is we've already dumped the gas we need. So the gas that I need to hang around and try two or three times or wait for it. And so there's 15 or 20 of us that need to get aboard. And we now have to sequence ourselves on straight-in approaches, which takes more time. We can't uh, visually sequence ourselves in anymore. And we're like, I think. I said, oh, I'm cleaning up. I said, saving gas. He goes, oh, God, I think we're going back to Al Jabber. Uh, now at least we know where it is. Um, but I don't want to go back. If we go there, we're not bringing the planes back today. Uh, and that means the planes aren't being used for a mission. Uh, and that means whatever ground forces are expecting us that night aren't going to get their ground forces. I'm not a pilot there on the ship to fly it, and they're not there to, build a, uh, to load a plane. So don't want to do it, but you do what you do. We get in line. We sequence in. The radar controllers that normally tell you to follow the person uh, and steer you around to about two miles behind somebody, they actually ask me at one point, where are you? I'm like, you don't have me on radar? I said, no, the sand in whatever this is has blinded our radar. Uh, I said, okay, well, I've got radar still working good. There's an airplane in front of me about two miles. He's like, good, follow him. <laughs> that was it. That was all I got was follow him. Uh, that's all right, I'll follow him. So it's just radar. I'm looking at sand and, and rain and cloud. There's nothing visual. I'm just following a radar track two miles in front of me. 
But we know what we do. We know how to do it. We know the pattern. Everybody's going to fly it the right way. We just don't know whether we're going to get on board the ship. So we get to the ship. It's my turn. Uh, at three quarters of a mile, you call the ball, which means I can see the lens, and I've got the landing all by myself. Uh, and at three quarters of a mile, I don't see anything. So I let them know I can't see the ship. They say, keep it coming. I get about halfway there, and they say, hey, check your taxi light on. So it's so bad they can't see me. But if I turn my taxi light on, at least the people on the ship can see me before I can see them. Give me a little help. So taxi light comes on. Like, hey, do you see the, can you call the ball yet? Nope, can't see it yet. Well, keep it coming, we've got you. I'm like, okay, that's good. But all they see is a light. That's it. That's all they see is a taxi light out there. They can't tell how far it is. They can't tell anything else. And about, uh, about a quarter mile, uh, I start breaking out of the sand and the mist. The, the LSOs give me one last, hey, right for lineup, make one play for the deck and land. And you land and you trap and you get on board and then you get out of the way. Because you know there's 12 other guys that need to land right behind you and nobody can afford to go around. Uh, so I land, I pull over, I watch my wingman land, he gets aboard, and we are absolutely relieved. Uh, the recovery's still going on, but I'm in my cockpit, I'm on my ship, I'm not going flying anymore, this is a good day, we made it back, all is good. Uh, the one f last bit of excitement was the very last plane to recover from us was the, the, uh, the COD, the, the C2, which is the carrier onboard delivery. It's propeller driven cargo plane that brings us our mail, brings people back and forth, brings parts. It was stationed in Bahrain. Well, he's the last one in the line. And uh, I, I'm parked and I'm shutting down and I'm getting ready to turn off the radios and I hear them tell, hey, password 2-1, which is the COD, uh, hey, the flight deck's clobbered. Just go back to Bahrain. I don't have room for you. Your signal is to go back to Bahrain. And that's, that's normal for them. That's what they do. They live in Bahrain, to tell you the truth. That's where their, that's where their stuff is. I'm, I don't know why they even want to come to the ship besides so deliver stuff and go back. So they can go back to their four-star hotel. Uh, but they make the call. They're like, hey, password 2-1, your signal is divert. Go back uh, to Bahrain. And I hear, unable. Unable, that's, that's weird. Uh, but there's no response to that. And I'm getting ready to shut down. I'm like, well, this is going to get interesting because there's nowhere to park him anymore because everybody's been jammed on the ship. Uh, they come back, hey, password 2-1, uh, your signal is divert. Go back to Bahrain, it's 180 for 60 miles, whatever it is, 100 and something miles. And they say, unable. I said, unable, you can't get back to Bahrain. Understand, password 2-1, you cannot get back. They said, a firm. Well, keep coming. Uh, <laughs> so they don't have a refueling capability. Uh, and so they keep coming. They cram all the flight deck folks behind the lines, get them out of the landing area. And they bring this guy aboard, uh, and he lands. And everything is fine. But it's... Again, the worst weather I've ever seen on the ship, day or night. Uh, and everybody got aboard first pass, first try, uh, which was amazing. So the, the LSOs, the landing signal officers that help you, give you that last minute correction and keep everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing, got awards that day for that recovery. Uh, so that's a long story about a day that went not as I expected. Uh, and it reminds you that your training takes care of you. If you do what you're supposed to do, you're 90% of the way there. The other part of it is there, you need the mindset of there's always somebody out there trying to kill you. Sometimes it's the bad guys, but usually not. Usually the biggest threat is the weather that wasn't forecast, the flight deck uh, not being where it was, the tanker that had to get moved. There's always somebody, if you have that mindset of anything could go wrong that I'm counting on, then you always have something up, uh, you know, in your, in your bag of tricks to get you to that next spot that you've been trained to. So it was a long day. We all got aboard. Uh, and, of course, the first thing I got in the ready room when I landed there was, hey, don't get out of your flight gear. You're going flying in an hour. We took all the new guys off the schedule. You guys are going flying. Uh, well, all right, let's do it. Uh, so you run down in flight gear, go get something to eat come back to the ready room. Unfortunately, they're like, nah, they've canceled all flights. Nobody's going flying tonight. The weather's too bad. I go, are you sure? Because right now I'll go, but in five minutes, I'm not going anywhere. So if you tell me we're not going, we're not going. And so he said, nope, officially canceled the rest of the night. So take the flight gear off uh, and, you know, try to unwind, tell a good story with your buddy, debrief intelligence about what all that went on, uh, and finish your day and uh, wish you had a drink. So uh, a long day, but 
it realized, I realized, and I call this one of the great days uh, on there because all the things that you've been taught, whether it was tactics, you know, how to, uh, how to load the bombs, program them, get them to where they need to be, release them right, whether it was airmanship, just flying through bad weather for 28,000 feet with a wingman is a challenge and not something you know how to do the first day you get into the Navy. Uh, the leadership of being in charge of the flight. My wingman needs to go right now back to divert. I need to find somebody else who can get us gas. All those decisions and then deciding it's not going to work out and coming back and getting on board. All those things that you've been trained to do in all those areas got tested on that one day. Uh, so I felt like uh, my instructors will be proud of me. <laughs> all the things that uh, they taught me to look out for and all the things I learned all through flight school paid off uh, and it was uh, you know, a success, you know, and so that was, that was a big day. And this is a video, not from my aircraft, but from one of the other on that actual recovery taken there. So that's one mile and the altitude's up at the top right at 350 feet. Uh, it's flashing and going down because this is the time when I normally tell the ship I can see them. And they say, call the ball and there's no call. I can't see you, Clara. Keep it coming. All right. Well, now I'm at a half mile, 10 seconds of landing. I don't see anything. Keep it coming. Hey, I think there's a ship out there. All right, we see you. Hey, right for lineup. One wing dip. Uh, and pray you get aboard and you do. So that's, uh, fortunately, one of my wingmen kept his recording of his, uh, of his heads up display for that. Uh, it wasn't mine or Guido's, but it was one of our sister squadron folks and I found that. Uh, and so that was, that was the culmination of what you've been trained to do. That was it right there, you know, and nothing else is possible if you can't come back and do this. So uh, a full day, a busy day, uh, and after that I felt like I could do anything the Navy asked me to do. So um, that was my Navy combat experience. There were more, but nothing like that. Uh, you get older and wiser and you learn how to avoid stuff like that. So where does that bring me today? So I spent again, uh, after that was 2003, I spent the next uh, 12 years flying for the Navy uh, deployments as an instructor, some other things. Today I work, uh, retired three years ago, I work for a company called ATAC and our role is to still support the Navy and we are adversary aircraft that are contracted out to play the bad guys. Uh, and it's fun, it's a great time. Uh, I still get to stay in touch with the Navy and when they go take uh, pilots out and they try to teach them how to intercept an enemy aircraft, uh, how to train their tactics or if they, the ships before going on deployment need to know how to identify aircraft, to run an intercept, to find that aircraft with, uh, with their own aircraft, to identify you, figure out who you are, where you're from. We get to play that role for them. And sometimes we get to play the role of an enemy missile and I get to fly low and fast at a ship, uh, which is great fun for me. I'm sure the young airman on the other side who's supposed to be in charge of shooting me down is not having any fun because uh, he's being tested. But that's what I do now. Uh, and it's great fun. I fly at a Point Magoo. Uh, and that'll take me to sometimes you have rough days. So a year ago in August, August 22nd, uh, last year, I was flying the Hawker Hunter. So this is the airplane we fly. It's old, but it's in good shape. It's cheap to operate, which is why as a company, a private company now, that's why you operate them. Uh, you're trying to make money and you're a business still. So no matter how much you love doing it, you gotta make, uh, you gotta make money at it. So we have these older planes, we fixed them up. They fly pretty well and we go out and do our missions. There's a picture of me about, uh, it was that week I went flying last August. As you see, I'd grown a goatee. I was having fun in Point Magoo, playing the bad guy. And that's an F-18 on my wing. So we'd gone down to, to support an aircraft carrier exercise before they go on deployment. So those exact guys, fast forward 15 years later, that need to go out on deployment, need to know how to run an intercept, need to know how to defend themselves, have asked for us to come out and pretend to be the bad guys. So that's what I'm doing. They send an F-18 to come stay on my wing and that's what he does. He says, up, oh, it's a Hawker Hunter. He's carrying a jamming pod and he's headed toward the ship. And they tell him, all right, escort him until he, if he does anything squirrely, shoot him down. And if, if he's just flying around, then escort him until he leaves. And that's what the F-18s are doing and that's great. That's him doing his job and that's me doing my job. Uh, and all is going well. About an hour into the flight, the F-18s have gone away and some Air Force guest pilots are taking part in the exercise and they're now on my wing. Uh, and they're escorting me and things don't go quite right. Uh, and from a beautiful blue sky afternoon day in August of just flying along, taking pictures out my window, looking for the ship, having that kind of fun, uh, a plane crosses in front of my nose too close 
and I go through the turbulence and the jet wash behind them, uh, there's a decent thump, and that's not that uncommon. But then when I go to maneuver after that, the plane departs uh, and it goes out of control. I start spinning over and over to the left. I was trying to go right, uh, and things have gotten really bad very quickly. Uh, I have a few moments where it stops spinning, uh, where I have some, some time to try to figure out how to rectify the problem, figure out what's going on. Uh, I can't. And passing through 4,000 feet, I realized this is not going well. I'd started at 14,000 feet, uh, and in less than a minute, I'm passing through 4,000 feet, watching an altimeter spin down pretty quick with a big face full of ocean, uh, and it's time to get out of the airplane. So I reach down like I've been trained. You grab onto the handle. You try to get in a good body position, and you pull. The, the questions I get asked most are, hey, were you, were you worried about pulling the handle? And I, no, I wasn't time. I didn't have time to worry about the repercussions of pulling the handle. Um, yes, I'm going to give up a plane in, into the ocean, and it's going to be gone. Yes, I might get hurt. Yes, I might end up in the water a long way, and I may or may not get rescued in a sufficient amount of time. All those things you can think about afterwards. But out of control, passing through 4,000 feet, none of that comes to mind. Uh, you do what you need to do next, and that is reach down and pull the handle and get out. So I do. Uh, everything goes the way it's supposed to from that point on. Uh, the ejection seat, well, first the canopy fires. There's explosives in the canopy. That gets punched out of the way. The ejection seat fires. It's a good shot. You come out. The chute opens. That's a good shock. And now you're tumbling through the small cloud layer that was out there at about 2,000 feet, waiting for that to slow down and figure out what's next. I'm supposed to look to see if I got a good parachute. Uh, I look up, I can see a little bit of the parachute hanging over me. I, go, I hope it's a good chute because there's nothing I can do about it now. Uh, I look down at my feet and I can see water coming up. Uh, I'm like, oh, I do not want that parachute connected to me when I hit the water. Uh, 20 years of Navy training, every four years we go through water survival in a pool. And they put you in a parachute and they drag you through a pool and they put you in a dunker that goes upside down and they hoist you up by a, a hoist from a helicopter spraying water at you in a pool. You do that every four years in your Navy gear. Uh, and so I'd done that, I guess, five times in the Navy, which was great uh, because everything, almost uh, with the exception of my flight gear being a little different than what I had in the Navy, goes as planned. Uh, I end up in the water. Uh, I'm talking to my, my wingman who sees me. I am talking to the next crew of F-18 to come over and set up on station for me. And then I'm talking to a helicopter crew uh, that's going to come and get me. Uh, all that stuff went great from my perspective. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I didn't have time to worry about how long I was going to be there. I didn't have time to worry about what if it gets dark, uh, what if there are gray creatures floating around in this ocean with me. Uh, I've struggled a little bit with my parachute to get out of that as soon as I landed so that parachutes uh, eventually will sink. You do not want to be connected to your parachute when it sinks. So once you're in the water, all right, am I floating? Good. Let's stay floating and get out of this parachute. So I spent a little time dealing with that. About a half an hour, the helicopter crew's there, and about another hour or so, we finally make it into San Diego. This happened 100 miles off the coast of San Diego, um, middle of the day, just like this in August, so it was a perfect day. There's the helicopter crew that picked me up. I went and saw them afterward. There's the back brace I was wearing. So I broke two vertebrae in my back from the old ejection seat. I say old, meaning old design. There was nothing wrong with that seat. It functioned exactly the way it was supposed to. But in the 1960s, ejection seats weren't as gentle on you as they are uh, today. So I broke a couple of vertebrae, but no other issues. Um, and the helicopter crew on the left, uh, are the two pilots, the pilot and the co-pilot. Great day for the, uh, the pilot standing next to me. It was her very first flight as a helicopter aircraft commander. Very first flight to get that qualification. And if you know any Hilo folks, that is a huge deal to become the hack, the helicopter aircraft commander. They go years training to get that role. And it was her very first flight in that role. So she's like, yeah, this was great. I thought it was always going to be like this. Uh, <laughs> The, the rescue swimmer standing next to me on my left in the picture and uh, the, the air crewman that ran, the crew chief that ran the hoist and everything else next to him, uh, Petty Officers King and Johnson and then uh, uh, Lieutenants Anderson and Connick. They 
did everything exactly right. I went down and talked to him later. I had to ask him some questions and get my helmet back, which they were keeping, just so that I'd come back and ask him some questions. Uh, so I brought him plenty of booze and as much as I could carry. Uh, and I said, how did that go for you guys? Was this a pretty routine pickup for you? And they're like, no, we, we've never picked up anybody before. <laughs> like, I mean, we, we practice all the time with our rescue swimmer, but I, we've never rescued anybody for real. Like, and not, not only that, but in this whole squadron, I was in their ready room, they said, nobody in here has ever picked up a, an airman in distress. They've never picked up somebody out of the water. And I thought, all right, well, let me tell you how it went. And they said, yeah, we'd love to know what it was like from your perspective, because we train, but obviously the real world doesn't always come out like you train. But that was a month later, just before they went on deployment, that I went and saw them. And my assumption was that it went so smooth from my end that they do this all the time. Like, I just figured I was just the next idiot that fell off a ship that they pick up all the time. And the, and the, the response was, no, that doesn't happen all the time. It was our first time. And I didn't know the difference. They were so professional, so good at it, handled every problem that got put in their way, whether it was low fuel or, or a corpsman to pick up or you know, dealing with me, not knowing who I was. Obviously, I was, I was wearing a goatee at the time, which so now they've picked up a guy wearing a goatee out of the middle of the ocean in a flight suit from a plane that did not come from their ship. So they are, I'm sure, very, very confused on who I am. Uh, and it turns out my wallet stayed with me the whole time, and I just handed him my ID card, and that was nice to not have to go through the who are you speech. Uh, so absolutely to them, uh, hats off, and that was, I've gone back to my other squadrons to let them know that you guys are in good hands. If something, if it's not your day, if it's a bad day, go get in the water, the helicopters, crew will take care of you. They will, they will be there for you, and they will take care of you. Uh, and so that was a big deal to me. Um, so yeah, you have some rough days out there, but the thing that I took away from that day was how good a day that really was. I had one bad, I had one thing go wrong. It was a catastrophic event, but it was one thing that went wrong. And I went from sitting in my cockpit, all happy, taking pictures on a perfect day, to ejecting, destroying a, you know, a jet airplane in the ocean, which they'll never recover, uh, and hoping that somebody will, that all this stuff is going to work and that somebody's going to be there to pick me up before I either freeze to death or get lost in the dark. Uh, all the other things, my ejection seat, the parachute, my survival gear, radios, my GPS beacon, all that stuff worked. My wingman knew exactly what to do and had people there on top of me before I could even get my radio out. Uh, the other F-18s kept an eye on me till the helicopter, till they could get their helicopter there. The crew of people on the ship took care of me and knew where I was and knew where to send me and did everything they could to help me out. Those all went absolutely right. Then there's things we don't have control of, the weather. Had that been an overcast marine layer day down there, that's a different experience. Helicopter's not going to see me from a half mile away. The F-18s who have found my location are not going to know where I am below that weather. Uh, the ocean, it was August off of San Diego, beautiful summer day. Had that been December, it's a different story. Had it been night, a very, very different story. Uh, so for the one thing that went wrong, and granted it went pretty wrong, there were a whole lot of things that went right. And that goes to the people, but just some of it. You just roll the bones and, hey, it was, it was summer and I didn't get cold until I was, you know, getting pulled out of the water. So, uh, so that was a good day. So I, I take away that you never, sometimes you're never more than a minute <laughs> to wishing you were back where you were uh, and you don't know how this, this crazy thing's going to go. Um, but you stick to your training, you pay attention, and you count on other people and they'll be there for you. So that's what I take away and I hope you take away from that too that on any given day, there's 4,000 people on an aircraft carrier making that thing run so that uh, guys like me get to do the luckiest job in the world. Um, so think about them, and I appreciate uh, all of you here and your enthusiasm and your passion for aviation and listening to my stories. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. So what actually happened about, to the aircraft? Uh, well, first, we'll never know. Uh, it's at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and while the Navy might bring an airplane back up to find out what went wrong, that's expensive and they have those assets and we don't. Uh, I have my suspicions uh, and I feel pretty strongly that the, the linkages in the left wing, which uh, there are hydraulic 
mechanisms that give you power to, to operate the ailerons and whatever had either broken or become, uh, yeah, dislodged or jammed. I know at one point during the, uh, the out of control flight that I could not move the stick to the right. So at that point I knew it wasn't a, you know, I hadn't stalled, I wasn't in a traditional spin. There's something physically wrong with my airplane and I don't know what it is. So once you establish that, uh, you, you start giving up on trying to solve the problem because I can't fix a wing. I can do a lot of things in the cockpit, but I can't fix a wing. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, we inspected all of our planes as soon as they landed. Um, we didn't fly them for a few days. Went through the history of that airplane. Nothing uh, unusual. Tested our other planes. Uh, and so we don't know. Uh, I just suspect that the, uh, the hydraulic booster that runs that aileron uh, became dislodged and jammed. Uh, and therefore, when I was doing what I do, only the right wing was providing the lift and it would just go around. So that's my expectation. I had a question about the, uh, my carrier locator beacon or some way to uh, locate myself should I find myself in the water or uh, when you're in combat, they give you combat ones that are uh, encrypted so the enemy can't find you. Uh, but we fly civilian missions over the water, and we have loaded up our vests with the best stuff we can buy off the shelf. So I had a good radio, and I had a GPS uh, beacon that you can buy from any rescue or, or hiking adventure store, and it's waterproof. It was interesting to realize that I had to read the directions on it. <laughs> uh, and again, one of those things you're glad it's not at night, um, because finding a light and holding a light while swimming, not the easiest thing in the world. So I found it read the instructions, pulled the cap off, activated it till the light came on. But then what? I got only have two hands, and I want to answer a radio, so you got to let go of that and find the radio, but now it's on a tether six feet underwater. So in hindsight, not, not a great piece of gear for that moment for me, wasting time to just let something sit underwater. They did get a hit from it. Uh, it wasn't accurate, but that's to be expected once it goes underwater. Uh, but at that point, I had found aircraft above me, and it was more important for me to talk to them and tell them I see them and I'm good, and this is where I am, than it was to, to activate that beacon. So we have something, and it would work, I assume, if I kept it above water. Do we ever get comfortable with night operations on the ship? Uh, not usually. The, the rare instance where you do get comfortable, there is a giant moon, uh, and the weather is perfect, and the seas are calm, and everything's as great as it can be. And that's usually your worst landing. Uh, inevitably, you, fail, you miss the wires, you have a crummy landing uh, because it's too comfortable. Uh, daytime, challenging, hard, fun. Nighttime, just challenging and hard. Uh, there's no fun in it. Um, and it is work every time at night. Uh, you can lull yourself into a little bit of comfort when you can see the ship from 10 miles away, you can see the wake and know that it's, the ship's not bobbing, the winds are steady, I've got plenty of gas, there's tankers, we're 50 miles from San Diego if, I, if for whatever reason we can't land there. But like I said, those are usually your worst landings because you've, you've actually relaxed and that's not good. So, uh, so no, you don't get comfortable, but I honestly think that's what, makes, that's what makes you good at it. If you were to take it for granted and think I got this, that's when things don't go well. But uh, so no, I never did, I can't say I ever had a night landing where it was routine. Did I ever bolter? So the Navy term for when you land past the last wire is bolter. And no, I never boltered. Uh, well, that's what every Navy pilot will tell you. Uh, of course we all bolter, uh, <laughs> but nobody will ever admit to that. Uh, but from your very first flight in training, uh, on your very first carrier landing, you do it with the hook up. You aren't gonna stop on your very first one for a couple of reasons, but one of those is, is you need to expect and always plan that you're gonna miss a wire. Sometimes you just land past the last one. Sometimes your hook just skips over the wire. It bounces on the flight deck just enough and it just timing's right and it doesn't grab the wire. So on every landing, you are prepared to go around. Uh, and so you learn that from the very beginning. You land every time, procedures are identical. You go to full power and get ready to take off again. Uh, and so it happens from time to time. Sometimes it's wire. Sometimes they forget to tell you they took the fourth wire off of the ship. Uh, and you start landing. You're like, ah, I'm a little bit high. I'm going to land a little long, but I still couldn't catch the four wire. I've been doing this long enough. I know I'm going to catch a four wire. And then you don't stop. And, oh, oh, God, I was going to stop. Uh, and turns out, oh, we didn't, we didn't tell you. The fourth wire had to get removed for some re repair. You had three other wires, though. I was like, yeah, but you didn't tell me. 
well, we don't want you aiming for the first one. So, uh, so it's going around is embarrassing is the bottom line. It means you didn't do your job very well most of the time. Uh, so it's embarrassing. We don't like to admit to it. And, and consequently, that entire ship of 4,000 people, if you're the last one to land, is waiting for you. The ship can't turn. They can't close the flight deck. All those guys that have been carrying chalks and chains and bombs and bullets and all that stuff can't go get dinner. They're all waiting for you. So it's embarrassing, it's humbling, uh, and that's why nobody ever admits to that ever happening. But we all do. So is there uh, an ILS or a precision approach radar uh, in the F-18 and it's aircraft specific? And back then, uh, so 10 years ago in the F-18s, Yes, we have two systems. One acts identical to an ILS. It's not the same system, so you can't use it at a civilian field. But we get crosshairs uh, in the HUD, just like anything else. And then we also have a system that will talk to the airplane attached to a beacon with a radio signal and pass us commands. And you could, at that time, you could couple up the airplane and let it fly itself on board the ship. Uh, so they have that technology, they have that capability. In the last three or four years, the process uh, and the, the computing power and the airplanes and the technology has increased a generation more and it is a much easier process to get the plane aboard the ship, which is good because it's a hard thing to do. Uh, so we have those instruments, we have those systems. What I have that's different than a civilian world is a runway that's moving. So you've got to chase that ILS as it moves away from you uh, and it doesn't always work. And so. Uh, they can give you a precision approach radar and talk you through the procedures to get down, but in the end, the last 15 to 18 seconds, as you saw there, there's no, there's no instrument system that's going to make that perfect for you. Uh, you've got to fly that, but you can't fly it until you can see the ship. So the instrument procedures get you there until you can see it, and then it's over to what you've been trained to do. Absolutely. So two questions there. One, uh, the glide speed on the emergency profile into Kuwait. Uh, in the F-18, it's a wonderful plane. You get up to 30,000 feet, you pull it to idle, and you maintain 250 knots. Nice round number, and it's the best glide speed for the airplane, uh, and it will get you a lot farther than you would think for a piece of metal with, with very little thrust coming out. Uh, so 250 knots, and that's, uh, yeah, we learned that from day one, and you practice that profile in the simulator. Uh, your second question, uh, shoot, I forgot it already. What was it, sir? Oh, the Hornet versus Super Hornet. Yeah, the Hornets versus the Super Hornet. So I flew the F-18 Charlie, uh, like you see in the picture there, for four years, five years, until I got qualified in the Super Hornet. And then I flew both, and I went on a deployment, and I actually was qualified in both airplanes at the same time on the ship. So the differences are the Super Hornet's bigger. It carries more fuel. Uh, it has newer stuff because <laughs> it's a newer airplane. The radar's better. Uh, it has another station to carry weapons. But inside, there, it's almost easy to forget which airplane you're in. And there are times when guys have, like myself who are qualified in both have come into land and gotten confused in which one they were in because it, it makes a difference to the folks in the arresting gear to set the, uh, the, the landing weight. And if you forget, that screws everybody up. But uh, the differences between the two, the older uh, Alpha through Delta, what we call the Legacy, is a quicker rolling airplane. It's lighter, it's a little more nimble, uh, it turns sharper and quicker and rotates about itself much better. The Super Hornet's bigger, it's a little bit sluggier, uh, but it's got bigger engines and carries more fuel. So uh, I don't know a good analogy between the two, but from inside the cockpit, 90% of your flying is identical. Um, if you want a dogfight, the, the F-18 Alpha or Charlie that you see that's very similar to the YF-17 sitting out there is a more nimble dogfighter. Uh, the Super Hornet has bigger engines and will allow you to go faster and turn harder for a longer period of time because of that thrust. So fairly similar, but just different enough that uh, there's a few things to pay attention to. So after my ejection, how long was I off the uh, flight schedule? Uh, interesting thing about old ejection seats, they, they tend to have a, an acceptable amount of injury, which is what I had, uh, and I'm perfectly fine with that acceptable amount of injury because I'm still here, so that's a great thing. Uh, but because it's an injury like that, they have modern technology now to fix those injuries. So when they go into your back to fix a couple of broken bones, they will usually put in some screws uh, and some hardware to keep the bones straight uh, while they heal and protected while they heal. Well, you can't get back in an airplane, an ejection seat with those bones and screws, uh, with those bolts and screws in. So 
it was about six months of healing and deciding that I wanted to get those, those hardware out. But within, that happened in August. Uh, by November, I was cleared by the FAA to fly anything that didn't have an ejection seat. So I was healed for all intents and purposes in four or five months. It took another three months or so to get the hardware removed to be able to get back in an ejection seat. So all in all, nine or 10 months. So a lot of time watching other people go fly. Am I still flying and am I still having fun? Uh, almost. Almost uh, to both, I guess. Uh, I am clear to go flying. I am waiting to get trained up in a different aircraft right now. We've been waiting to start for the last month, just waiting for the aircraft trainer to be available. Uh, so I'm almost flying and almost having fun. Uh, I, I still work where I work and I still take care of operations uh, and do the ground job that I had uh, with my company uh, and help the new pilots that come through and all that stuff. Uh, and make sure they go on and they know where the, the customer is, which is the Navy squadrons or the ships. So I enjoy being around the people. I enjoy the business. Uh, I enjoy the fact that we're training the Navy folks before they go out on deployments to be good at what they do. Um, but my own personal enjoyment is, is still on, on, uh, on pause right now. Uh, but it should be over relatively quickly. Uh, the other aircraft that my company flies that I'm going to get into next is the L-39. Uh, it flies different missions. Uh, for our company. It is not on the Navy contract, so it doesn't fly for the Navy, but we do uh, contracts, shorter contracts with it, and sometimes do uh, close air support training or other uh, missions for that airplane. So that one's free, and we have a two-seater, and so I'm going to try to get trained up in that real soon. Oh, faster airplane. Yeah, if you want to talk uh, business, there are faster airplanes coming to our company, and that was your question, uh, was was what do we have that's coming? Uh, the company has made a down payment on F-16s. So those are coming and they bought 63 Mirage F-1s uh, that we've taken from France and are putting back together and modernizing the cockpits uh, to do contract work for the Navy and Air Force. So those are in our hands and uh, getting put together right now. So there are faster. And the other plane that my company flies out of Point Magoo is the Kafir. The Israeli Kafir is a fantastic plane. It'll fly Mach 2. It's faster than any Navy plane that we have right now uh, on the flight line, on the, on the aircraft carrier. Um, it's older technology, and it doesn't do much else besides fly fast. But if you want to fly fast, and the Navy needs somebody to test a, either as a profile of a, of a fast enemy or a, a cruise missile coming in, we're, it's a perfect plane for that. So there are faster things. Uh, we've got some, and we're getting more. Well, thanks, everybody, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.